Hello, I'm Kyle Colton. I'm a ground station RF engineer here at Planet, and we're presenting today merging diverse architectures for multi-mission support on behalf of the ground station operations team here at Planet. A little bit about our constellations. Planet was founded in 2010, and we began with rapid iteration on the CubeSat form factor, averaging about 14 builds over the first six years, and with a three to six month design life cycle on those builds. We worked hard to use COPS components where we could, get those up into space quickly, and test those on orbit to see what works and what doesn't work. Our current build has a 1.8 gigabit per second X-band radio and lines up with the industry standards for spectral bands, and then has lots of onboard storage to store those photos in between downlink sessions. The X-band radio was further presented in the 2019 small set paper crossing gigabit per second from the 3U cube set. As I mentioned, the doves comprise one portion of our on-orbit assets. And so the dove constellation has about 130 CubeSats with 3.7 meter GSD. And those CubeSats start in about a 475 kilometer orbit and then slowly over their lifetime come down in orbit. They don't have active propulsion. They just rely on differential drag for phasing in orbit and collision avoidance maneuvers. In 2015, Planet added the five RapidEye small satellites, and those had a 6.5 meter GSD, and also crucially added an imagery archive back to 2009. They were retired earlier this year and moved into a lower orbit using their propulsion to be good orbital neighbors and clean up the Earth's orbits where possible. Also, we have the 18 SkySat satellites on orbit. Those are our higher resolution satellites with 6.5 meter GSD. And those are at about 450 kilometers circular. There are tasking satellites. And so when we detect change using the background imaging of the doves or when a customer requests it, we can get the higher resolution imagery from the SkySats and just get a zoomed in, so to speak, imagery of what is going on on that portion of the Earth at that time. The three latest SkySats launched on the Starlink 8 launch in early June, and we should have three additional SkySats launching on the Starlink 10 launch coming up. We're happy to announce that we've contacted all three. In fact, we contacted all three within the first two passes, and we began orbit raising maneuvers within the first four days after the launch. And a lot of that credit goes to the SkySat mission operations team and the Block 3 commissioning team. And we'd like to think that we play our small part in providing the ground stations for the access to those satellites. Going a little bit more into our ground stations, we have ground stations split across Dove operations and SkySat operations right now. So the Dove operations stations, we have 11 different sites with 40 different antennas across those sites. Four of those sites have SX capabilities for our data downlink and the remainder and in fact, all of our sites have the TTNC radios for background health and ranging, scheduling, all of those tasks. And the four sites with SX capabilities are highlighted here in the darker blue, and then the rest of them are in the lighter blue. For SkySat operations, we began with four different sites and seven antennas across those sites, and then we added five geographically diverse antennas for Block 3 specifically. And so the five newer sites are the mid-latitude sites on this map. Some of those were borrowed from the Dove operation sites, and we converted them over to help Block 3. And really, we're focusing right now on merging those two architectures to be able to increase our utilization of the antennas and to improve the interoperability between our constellations. Some of the benefits that we're hoping to realize with that is the higher duty cycle of the expensive equipment, especially the antennas themselves, and overall higher throughput through those antennas, getting more data down to the ground and to our customers. We also see some benefits to the satellites themselves, such as the shorter on-orbit pass gaps. Uh, that reduces the reaction latency of satellites on orbit and also aids in on-orbit maneuvers like tip and cue, where we can quickly detect changes in our imagery using the background imaging of the doves and then task the higher 
resolution sky sats to look in depth in that location and see exactly what changed. A key cornerstone of this effort is virtualization. And so we've been using operating system level virtualization, which gives us a very strict control over the runtime environment and the inputs and outputs to those containers. And it also gives us very well-defined hooks for starting and stopping those containers and really controlling what's going on there. We had already been doing this a little bit. As I mentioned earlier, we have our high-speed radios on the Dove CubeSats, and we've had multiple iterations there, what we've called HSD1 or HSD2, the HSD2 being the more recent. And those aren't quite compatible on the ground software-wise, and so we've launched both in containers. And what we'll do is we will look at the upcoming contacts uh, via scripts and then bring up whichever container applies to the upcoming satellite that the ground station is hoping to talk to. And that really helps us to control what's running on the ground station very, very seamlessly and have very well-defined hooks over what's running, what's not running, because we can stop those containers at the end, bring up the next set of containers. In the background, we always have generic containers running that apply across both of those radios and help us communicate with the satellites. Just as an example, we have also brought some of our components over from our Dove operating uh, hardware to our SkySat Ops hardware. For example, for the Block 3 launch, we were reusing some of the Dove antennas for the SkySat launch, and we were able to bring over our dish tracking software, even though the operating systems aren't quite compatible. We could run all of that dish tracking within containers, and the software is none the wiser as to what system it's running on. It sees the same inputs and outputs, and it has the same dependencies controlled within that container. We've also done this with our monitoring software to have a uniform bird's eye view over what's going on on our ground stations at any given time. So this is an ongoing effort and we've been using this virtualization where possible. We're not possible, we've been running hardware side by side, but we're looking to expand that virtualization and fully run all the containers on a single ground station and be able to communicate with any asset with the same ground station. Through this effort, we've seen significant increase in the antenna utilization and therefore the data down. For example, this is a chart of one particular antenna where we saw a significant increase in the data down in the antenna utilization. The boxed area on this chart is the area after those efforts were put in place, and you can see a noticeable increase. The data is a little bit noisy, but when we averaged it out, we saw about 60 to 70% increase in our data down. Planning the network was also a very key aspect because this was a new orbital plane for this new constellation. And so we simulated various different geographies for the antennas, but at this time, our simulation still requires human input, human grading of how the simulation turned out, and then correction of the, the model that we were checking. Our main focus here was on pass gaps. We wanted to get one contact per satellite per orbit, and that corresponds to about 90 minutes. Here you see in this chart a simulation that we ran and plotting out the distribution of pass gaps. You see a little bit of an outlier there up at the 180 or so minute mark, and that would be a two orbit pass gap, which is what we're trying to avoid. And so by looking at the distribution of geographic antennas, we can play around with that and then come to a better solution, run the simulation again. And now, as you can see in this chart, we got everything within that 90 minutes, which means one contact per satellite per orbit. In addition to meeting that one satellite per contact, excuse me, one contact per satellite per orbit goal, we also were able to calculate using the simulation the benefits of allowing secondary or tertiary access on these new antennas. So the new antennas were primarily for this block three launch that we talked about earlier, but using the same simulation and opening up two new mid-latitude sites to the existing constellations on secondary and tertiary axis basis, we were able to see an average per satellite contact duration increase in 13% and a reduction 
of the average pass gap size in those constellations by 11%. And so that really helps us to uh, quantify the improvements that that work would give to our satellite operators. We've also looked into improving our simulation efforts by automating the trials and grading of the simulations, but there is admittedly still some constraints there because certain countries have better regulatory environments or certain countries are otherwise more beneficial to go to for various reasons, whether we have antennas there already and an existing site and relationships or what have you. So in summary, we're using operating system level virtualization to share software between the platforms. Uh, we didn't cover it here, but in our paper, we covered a little bit of recreating hardware radios using software defined radios to reduce the RF chain complexity. And last, using our network modeling tools to help optimize the geographic placement of the different antennas that we wanted to build out for this new block three launch. I'd like to especially thank my co-authors on this paper and SkySat's, uh, Planet SkySat mission operations team and commissioning teams, and then also Planet's RF comms team that really helps drive that 1.8 gigabit per second X-band radio that we mentioned, and the, the Dove operations satellite operations team at Planet. We'd be happy to take your questions, and please feel free to reach out to us directly. And thank you so much for allowing us to present this paper today.